My name is Gary Files and I'm the director of the Keeled Observatory in Northumberland, the United Kingdom. And I've came here to sunny California, to Pasadena, for Space Fest 2014. And the reason I've came here is because some of the most important people in the history of space exploration have gathered here, including men who walked on the moon. Jack Robert Lausmer is a former NASA astronaut and politician. Jack was one of the 19 astronauts selected by NASA in April 1966. He served as a member of the astronaut support crews for the Apollo 9, 10 and 13 missions. He famously was the Capcom recipient of the Houston We've Had a Problem message from Apollo 13. One of the most important missions and the mission that sticks in quite a lot of people's memories is of course Apollo 13. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about those events and the effect it had on you? Yes, I was the uh, communicator uh, on the mission. We had um, three communicators that had a separate shift and the capsule communicator is the only one who can talk to the crew and uh, has to take uh, information from elsewhere. And that was you? And I, w I was the capsule communicator or Capcom uh, during this particular time in the flight. And so the, uh, the, uh, everybody can listen, but only one person talks to the crew, and th that person's the Capcom, and that's not the person who uh, solves all the problems. The people that solve all the problems are in the room, and, and the, the Capcom takes his, his uh, direction from the flight director, who was in this case uh, Gene Kranz. And uh, if uh, somebody had a problem within the room that needed to be solved, it uh, had to be vetted with all the other people to make sure it didn't affect their systems. And Gene Kranz would make sure that was so, and he would say, Capcom, tell them this. And I would say, well, I can't listen right now because I know they're doing that, but I would like to defer that. And he would say, no, tell them now. I'd say, yes, sir, I'll tell them now. So uh, that was the way the thing worked. But my job was to make sure that the information got to the crew in words they could understand in pilot lingo and to make sure that uh, when it was sent up, they weren't busy doing something else that was more important because I knew the flight plan. I had worked with them. I had, had simulated with them, and I knew what they needed to know and when it was. So I was kind of the interface between the crew and the flight director and mission control team. But basically, the flight, flight director was the one who made the decisions, and, uh, and it was my job to get the information to them. So that's what I did. And um, on uh, this particular night that we had the uh, challenge uh, that came our way, uh, everything was doing uh, very well. We were about 55 hours into the mission, two, a little over two days. The crew was uh, just about to get to the moon and they needed to activate the lunar module, turn it on, turn all the switches on, make sure all the systems work before they actually went down to the moon. And so uh, they were doing this and they were giving us a tour of what they were doing with the video camera. They were showing it, uh, us the, the panels that they had, what the, what the, uh, where the commander stood and where the pilot stood and, and the computers and all the environmental control system. They look out the window and see the earth. And uh, meanwhile, back in the control, uh, the viewing room behind the control room, all the families had gathered there, all the wives and all of the, uh, the kids and the, and the grandmothers and the uncles and and parents and so forth to see this and uh, and it was a, a great show and everybody felt warm and, and uh, very very uh, confident that everything was okay and they closed it by saying good night to this Apollo 13 effectively they were going to take you go to sleep and uh, everybody left the, uh, the viewing room before they got home and they all lived very close this explosion occurred and their whole world changed from being just perfectly rosy to being unknown and dangerous hazards and a real panic as far as they, the, the people were concerned and in the control center uh, we were noticing that we obviously noticed we had something wrong wrong the crew radioed down to me they said houston we got a problem and i had been talking to gene kranz about something he said say again please they said houston we got a problem And immediately within the control center, we saw the same thing. Everything uh, was was going haywire. It was different. The uh, a lot of the telemetry had been blown out by this explosion, and it wasn't getting to the ground. We didn't know the health of the spacecraft or what the systems were doing. 
and it was just very spotty data, and we couldn't figure out what was wrong. We thought of several things we had simulated that could be the wrong because of some of the symptoms we were seeing, and, and nothing really worked. Uh, nothing uh, re nothing re resolved the problem. But the crew had information just to look like on their meters that wasn't blown out because it was still on board, and they could see what was happening on all their dials and gauges. They could see the oxygen was going away. They could see that the, the electrical power was going down, which was caused by the oxygen going away in the fuel cells. And uh, after a while, uh, Jim uh, Lovell looked out the window. I see a big stream of particles going by the window. And uh, that clearly was uh, some kind of a fluid that was venting out of the spacecraft. So we've, with, with that clue and with all the other observations, it was clear that we were losing oxygen. Uh, pretty soon the, there'd be no electricity in the command module. We had to get them over into the lunar module like a lifeboat, turn, and that was already turned on and they could survive in there. And then we had to figure out whether or not they could stay or we could fix this problem or they're going to have to come home. But it, it, it was clear uh, very quickly that we weren't going to be able to land on the moon. You know, it was just going to be a real challenge to get them home and whether to have a direct return or whether to go around the moon or what, what trajectory to put them on uh, was debated. And we decided to let them go around the moon and come back. And it took a little more time, but it was the safest thing to do. So uh, they, uh, we got the crew uh, settled in. We got them safe, at least for the moment. We decided on how to get them back, and then we had to decide whether or not we had enough water and propellant and electricity and all that sort of thing to get them back. And so those calculations began. We uh, put our astronauts that uh, had been to the moon into the simulators, set up the same situation, and then uh, devised ways to uh, configure the electrical systems and so forth in order to conserve enough electricity, enough water. Water was necessary just, not just for drinking, but cooling the electronics so they'd work and uh, whether or not there was enough onboard consumables to get home and we found out there weren't and so we had to do uh, take other measures to uh, make it such that it was very uncomfortable to live in the command or lunar module but uh, we had to in order to save the, uh, the the cooling water and the electricity and so forth to to get back so all those calculations took place over the next uh, 24 hours and we figured out a way to get them back and, and pursued that and uh, became a successful mission and then, of course, uh, it was a great relief to get them back uh, on the ground. And uh, with the uh, control room just uh, erupted in, uh, in applause and, and, um, and, uh, and a relief, I guess you might say. And uh, then it was the aftermath to think about. Uh, one of the questions that somebody asked me quite soon was, you know, what would you have done if you couldn't have got them back? And I said, I couldn't answer the question. I, it just never entered my mind because we were so intent on being successful. And this was just me, it was the whole, whole team was intent on being successful. They never thought about what to do if they couldn't get them back. It's just the, uh, it's the idea of positive thinking. Uh, we didn't let negative thoughts enter our mind. And we had this vision of bringing them back and I think this is good uh, philosophy for anything you're trying to do, and that is we were uh, living in the time as though we were actually experiencing in a future outcome at the time we were doing it. And there was no way we could be anything but successful. So uh, I think that's a good uh, lesson to learn, and no matter what we're doing in life, that to have a positive outlook, a positive attitude, and just do your level best to make it work. But um, it was a remarkable mission in that it... Uh, uh, was thought as a uh, failure by NASA, and uh, NASA had made it actually look easy not because the, the rest of the world, what they saw was a successful space flight. One of the things that it did, though, was uh, everybody in the world realized uh, after a short time uh, communication uh, what the risks really were, that there had been an explosion on the uh, spacecraft on the way to the moon. The crew's lives were in danger. And it, it captured the interest of people all over the world. And we, we received, um, you know, letters of encouragement and prayers and so forth from, from people all over the world. So it was so a, a few days in which uh, everybody in the world was focused on the same hopeful outcome. And it doesn't happen very often that that occurs. I think the same thing occurred when we landed on the moon. Everybody in the world wanted us to be successful, not because we're Americans, but because we're, uh, you know, all... Uh, inhabitants of this uh, uh, good earth. 
And so uh, those kinds of events that gathered us together it was uh, uh, important from that aspect. The other important aspect was that even though uh, NASA tried to uh, uh, sort of uh, pass this off as uh, just an anomaly, uh, they don't want to uh, have any criticism that would terminate the program. It sort of sort of kept that quiet, and it wasn't and went on with Apollo uh, 14 to 15 and so forth. But it wasn't until uh, Jim Lovell wrote his book about this that uh, and the movie was made that people realized uh, what a risk this was and how, how close these three guys were to death for four days. And, uh, and the great, uh, uh, the great uh, performance of the mission control team in, in making this work. And as, as a result, the movie that they made was, even though everybody knew the outcome, was the most popular movie in the country for at least uh, four weeks running. And it still remains as one that's often shown and is very popular around the world. But it's a real, um, a, a real um, classic uh, example of uh, what, Ameri what, uh, what ingenuity and positive thinking and uh, knowledge and um, understanding of technology and so and but mostly the uh, the intent of the human heart and the human emotion to make things happen and get them done how, how the, important that is and, and uh, uh, accepting challenges of this sort and not allowing ourselves to be risk averse or put down by failure but to learn from them and go on I, I, it's pretty much. I'm pretty much speechless listening to that. It's absolutely wonderful. A real triumph for humanity is what it feels like. Apollo mm. 13 was. It almost feels. Like I got the sense that NASA and yourselves and everybody who's in that room for those four days reached out, quite literally into space and brought them back. Mm -hmm. um, and I think humanity has a debt to you guys for that to pay forever. And I think when my job. Um, in outreach and astronomy, which we try at the Keeler Observatory, for example, to bring people in and understand our true place in the universe and inspire the next generation of scientists and space explorers. What would be your message, Jack, to people who are thinking about it and wondering about what the contribution was from the Apollo program and how we can use that to move forward? Well, I like to encourage young people. I like to encourage everybody, especially the kids, because sometimes they think science and technology and education and math, STEM, as we say, is too difficult. It's not. It's fun. If you if this is what you like to do, I, there are, are lots of ways to apply your interest in mathematics and science. The world, learn about the world and we're living in, and see what we can do to use it to make our life better and to, uh, to enjoy life more and, and to contribute more. That's really what the world is all about. And so I tell kids that. Um, what they're, whatever they're doing, uh, they can start right now. Even if they're in elementary, they, by developing good habits, good study habits, good work habits, good thought habits, and so forth. And uh, because if they don't, they shouldn't wait till they're in high school because it's too late. So these, these habits are, are formed when kids are young. The parents need to, and teachers need to instill them with these kind of habits to, to do your best, always do your best. Just don't take second best, make sure that everything you, uh, you do is your best. Now someone else's best might be uh, better than yours, but all you need to do is your best. And we also need to, uh, to work hard. And there's, there's too many people, uh, too many kids playing video games and doing all those kind of things these days. They need to work hard at whatever they're doing. If it's school work, work hard at that. If it's athletics, work hard at that. If it's both of them, work hard at both of them. But you know, don't waste your time. And to um, be self-disciplined. Uh, we all know what discipline is, but sometimes we think it's not good. But uh, we're talking about self-discipline. That means that we don't have to have somebody else tell us what to do. We know something uh, to do right, we do right. Pick up the piece of paper on the floor. Make your bed so it's good. Clean up your room. Don't do a halfway job. You know, do your best. Do it. Make it look really good. And uh, and uh, also to not be afraid to fail. It. You know, we we learn from our failures, and we shouldn't allow ourselves to stop. Some people quit because they're afraid they'll fail again. But that's how we learn. And uh, so uh, the person that doesn't fail isn't doing anything. So it's important to re learn from your failures and not be afraid. To fail. I made lots of lots of mistakes in the space program and all through my life. But you have to do better the next time, rise, learn from them and get where you think you ought to go. Uh, develop your faith because uh, it's important to have uh, this extra faith to lean on. Sometimes the chips are down and it's uh, important to have that personal relationship with God and to help have him help you uh, get, get through whatever you're doing. So develop that faith. Uh, um, remember there's a, there's a whole lot of those kinds of things that we need to do. 
but uh, in the end, why people will finally decide what it is they want to do. And when they do, why well, they need to be committed to it, dedicated to it, and, and uh, decide that uh, this is what they want to do and they're going to do their best and work hard. And all, those deep, all of those good habits they've developed, they've put into action. And what they're really doing is preparing for an opportunity. Uh, you never know when this opportunity is going to come along, but if you're pre prepared for it by doing all these things, then you'll be ready, you'll get the job. But if you're not, somebody else is going to be better and they'll get it. So prepare for these opportunities by doing those things. And then when you see what that is that you really want to do, just never, ever, never, never, ever, never, ever give up. Because I think persistence is probably as good a, a quality as any in getting where you want to go. There are a lot of folks that uh, give up when they're just almost at the top of the mountain and a few more steps they would have made it or the curve in the road, you know, and go to see a better view. They just don't quite get there. Some folks are settled for being where they're at. That's all right. But if you want to do uh, be the best you can be and get where you want to go, you need to make sure that you don't quit too soon. Jack Lausma. Thank you for an absolutely stunning conversation, and I've got nothing whatsoever to add apart from thank you. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach a little bit. <laughs> thank you.